All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to Adobe Creative Cloud Live. My name is Terry White. It's my pleasure to be here streaming live to you on the Creative Cloud Facebook page. Welcome everyone. I can see Victoria is already in the chat and I see a bunch of people coming in. So welcome as you come in. Uh, it's gonna be my pleasure today to take you through seven things to look for when you're retouching or fixing or making your photos better. In other words, not so much just like re portrait retouching, which I'm sure a lot of you probably thought that, that that's what this would all be about, um, but just photos in general and, and what to look for when it comes time to making your photos look better. Because <clears throat> the key to retouching and the key to uh, photo editing, it's not so much the technique. The techniques aren't that aren't really that hard. It's really knowing what to look for and what to correct in the first place. Because if you don't know what to look for, then obviously you won't ever fix it or know how to fix it. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So Kathleen, Michael, Ramiz, uh, welcome everyone. And why don't we go ahead and jump to it? So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my computer. On my computer, I've got Lightroom Classic CC running. You don't have to be doing this in Lightroom, of course, but I, I use Lightroom to manage my photos. So that's an easy place for me to start because the photos I want to use have been strategically placed in a collection in the order that I want them in for the retouching that I'm going to be doing. So um, Horatio, welcome uh, all the way from Italy, and Robert, and again, Kathleen from uh, Sunshine, or is that sunny Arizona? <laughs> all right, so cool. All right, so with that said, uh, one of the first things to look for, and this is especially important when you're working with photos of people, is white balance. In other words, um, a, a color cast or the image is too much of one color, like too much yellow or too much blue. Those are typical signs of the white balances off in the shot. So for example, if I um, show you this image full screen, um, there are people of color, but there are people of too much color, <laughs> too much yellow in this case. And uh, I can, and even if I didn't see it in their skin tones, I can see it on the walls and the ceilings that should be white. They're kind of yellowish and brownish and goldish. And this is, uh, this is, is goldish a word? This is kind of one of those things that happens depending on the lighting that was, the image was captured under. So like, for example, when you take pictures inside your house, most likely the lights that you have are casting a more yellow tone, warmer tone on the room and therefore the people as well. And the reason for that is because we like looking at a warm scene. We like looking at warm skin tones. They make us look more alive. But when it's too much, then it's too much. So how do we fix white balance? Now, of course, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be doing a lot of this in Lightroom. Uh, you can do this. I'm trying to think, is there anything that I'm going to be showing that you can't do? No, I think pretty much everything I'm going to show except for one or two things can either be done in Lightroom Classic CC, Lightroom CC, and of course, Photoshop and Camera Raw. So it doesn't matter. And maybe I'll switch it up and, and open up a couple of them in Photoshop and, and show how you would do it in Photoshop as well. But the techniques would be the same across the application. So that part doesn't matter. All right. So if I wanted to fix the white balance on this particular photo, I would click, I would select it, click on the develop module, which will take me into the develop module for Lightroom Classic CC or the edit module inside of um, Lightroom CC or the camera raw filter or camera raw inside of Photoshop. They would all show me the same controls and show me the same slider. And in this case, white balance is a pretty easy fix. Uh, because it's, it's really one eyedropper, one eyedropper that lets you correct the white balance, provided you've got something in the image to be able to click the white balance eyedropper on. Typically, what the white balance eyedropper is looking for is something that's around 18% gray. Or, I should say, that should be 18% gray, because maybe now that gray is yellow. But whatever in that scene that you know should be gray, like the bumper of a car, 
or someone's uh, stainless steel watch or something that you know should be gray, that's what you'd be looking for. Now, in this scene, I don't really see anything, perhaps except for maybe his belt buckle, that should be gray. So instead, the next two colors I would look for is something that should be black or something that should be white. So, for example, the blouse that she's wearing, I know that blouse should be black. It should not have a yellow tint to it. So if I click my white balance eyedropper and just point anywhere on the black that's there and click, it will fix the white balance for me. Now, correct white balance doesn't always mean perfect white balance or it looks great. It just means now the white balance is mathematically correct. It's what it should be. The yellow has been removed. It's been toned back down to the proper proper white balance for this scene. However, you, you may not like it, and that's okay. You may not like the results of proper white balance. So that's why you still have a temperature slider to make your photos a little warmer for people or a little cooler for, you know, non-people. So, for example, if I still wanted to warm this image up a little bit, maybe the yellow that it had in it at first was too much, but I just want to make it just a little more warm, a little bit more friendly, then I would just drag that slider over ever so slightly, maybe about just that much, until I just warm up the scene a little bit more. So, just keep in mind that white balance is subjective. It is, it is not you know, a law. You don't have to live with the 18% rule. That's a good starting point. Once you get the proper white balance, then you use the temperature slider to adjust to taste. All right, so with that said, white balance, number one thing to look for in fixing your photos. The next one is a crooked horizon. And this is one of the things that now drives me the craziest, especially on landscape photos. So, for example, you get into a photo like this. Well, I was taking this uh, shot of my drone out on the lake, or out on the... Yeah, out of the bay, and uh, while I was like kind of tilting, getting getting a cool shot of the drone, that's fine. But when I look off in the horizon, the horizon's crooked, and that's driving me crazy. So either a crop out the horizon so I don't see it, and then it looks like just a just a kind of you know crooked drone, or fix the horizon. So uh, all the programs have various ways of doing this uh, in inside of Lightroom. The easiest thing to do is to go into the crop tool, which I was just in, and you've got a couple of things you can try. You can say, hey, fix it for me. That's the auto button. Auto will either work or it won't. <laughs> it's one of those things where if it can figure out what should be straight, it will try and straighten it. If it can't, it won't. So it's, it's it doesn't hurt to try it. Just know that in case it doesn't work, you'll have to do it on your own. So if I click auto, boom. It did it. It fixed it. Now, of course, it had to crop it in order to keep um, from introducing white space into the image. But that's okay. Uh, I can still adjust. No, I really can't. I don't think I can adjust much. Yeah, I can't get much outside of those boundaries. Um, I can move the photo around in the crop, though, and kind of get don't, don't crop that propeller off. And uh, once I click out of the crop, that would be my new horizon. Now, let's say... You didn't like the auto or the auto didn't work. The next thing you can do is make your own horizon line the way you want it to be. So there's an angle tool here. And of course, in, um, in Camera Raw, I think you've got the same tool. And in Photoshop, you've got a way to do it as well. There's a straighten command. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and just grab this, this angle tool, and I'm just going to go ahead and drag it out along the horizon that I think should be straight. In other words, I'm telling Lightroom, this is what should be straight in this photo. Just go ahead and do it. All right, so either way. So let me show it to you real quick. Um, I'm going to just edit edit a copy of it. Uh, yeah, we'll edit a copy of it inside of Photoshop. So that'll take over my, take my original photo over to Photoshop. And, uh, same thing. I'm in the crop tool. I just happened to be in that tool last time I was in Photoshop. But if you weren't, you switch to the crop tool and you notice the same icon. It's called straighten instead of angle. So you click the straighten icon and same thing. You just drag it along the line that you think should be straight. 
and it will crop. Now, the difference is Photoshop gives you one more benefit. It has content aware crop. So if I were to turn on content aware crop, it will let me drag out the sliders or it will guess at what it thinks it could fill in successfully. So if I were to click OK, I wouldn't lose as much of my image because content aware, we'll see how good of a job it does, did a pretty good job of filling in that extra space that I would have lost had I only did it in Lightroom. All right, so now if I save this and let it save and close it and switch back to Lightroom, it will be there next to the original because I said work on the copy. So I still have my original untouched and I have my new one from Photoshop. All right, that introduced some kind of weird thing in the upper right corner, but I'm okay. It's abstract. I can live with it. All right, so next thing, number three, cropping. Cropping is one of the biggest things, one of the number one things people should be doing um, to their photos to either recompose them if need be or to get rid of excess area. In other words, stuff we don't need. So if I look at this picture of my puppy Lisa... Well, for obvious reasons, I'd want to crop out the light stand and the soft box and the edge of the, of the seamless paper and the tape <laughs> and all the stuff that I don't need. But at the same time, that cropping could also uh, help me with um, the orientation because this image looks, a, she looks a little crooked, even though the paper is pretty straight. So what I could do. Switch to the crop tool. Oh, it's already kind of cropped. There are my feet. <laughs> All right, so anyway, I can continue cropping this. And I'm going to get to a point of no return because I'm going to get to a spot where I've got the image cropped, but there's still some distracting objects in the photo. So that's actually, that was number seven, but we're going to, we're going to tackle a little bit of it right now. So those distracting objects. So and let me go back to crop one more time and let me also tilt. Just tilt her up a little bit and then crop in some more. All right. And so anyway, we've got some distracting objects because if I crop any more, I'm going to crop off a paw and I don't want to do that. But I got this paper that's turned up a little bit and I can still see the, the end of that light stand. Now I could have brought that side in some more, but let's say I still want a little bit of space left in this photo. So once I cropped it as much as I could, the question is, where do I make these changes of getting rid of that light stand and getting rid of that paper fold? Now, I can do that. I can attempt to do it in Lightroom, or I know I can do it in Photoshop. So, really, the choice is up to you. So, for example, um, and Cami, I'm glad you appreciate the tips and the quick live demo. So, let's go ahead. First, let's, let's try it with Lightroom. You never, you never know. It might do a great job. So, Lightroom really doesn't have... Um, photo retouching tools. It's got a spot removal tool. And the spot removal tool used to be literally just for spots. Like you'd click on little dust spots inside your photo or camera uh, sensor dust. And it would just click and it would randomly pick another spot in the photo to clone from. But now you can, let's make the brush a little smaller. You can actually use it to paint. So I'm just going to paint out that light stand and it did okay. And I can also paint out this uh, paper fold. And that's not a great spot to pull from. Let's pull from over here. You can pick that up and move it around and tell it where to pick up from. So if I get out of the spot removal tool and look at the results, well, the light stand did pretty good. Down here, I'm not really happy with, like I can still see a little leftover paper fold. So that's in one of those cases where it's just not doing a fantastic job. So in this case, what I could do, same thing, edit this, edit in Photoshop. That's also Command E, by the way. And it will pop up probably, oh, it's just gonna pop up because it's a raw file, so it's not gonna even bother trying to make a copy because it does that automatically. All right, so now I could go in and I could say, you know what, this paper fold's really driving me crazy. I don't want it at all. So for example, I could use the patch tool. Let's get that little hair out of there too. And I could say, drag this along the edge here to get a better edge. And boom, it just replaces that edge with the other edge. And while I'm here, 
This is way faster. Using the spot healing brush is way faster than the spot removal tool inside of Photoshop. I can just get rid of all this little extra hair that was on the floor, clean up the floor a lot faster, a lot easier than trying to do that inside of Lightroom, which is definitely going to take more patience and time than just simply popping over to Photoshop and doing it. So this is really a case of do, using the right tool for the right job. And of course, I could duplicate the layer and make a copy and not work on the background. As some might be saying, oh my God, he's working on the background. But keep in mind, I've already got a copy over in Lightroom, so I'm not too worried about messing up here because I can always go back to the original. All right. It, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's get back to the... Change tools by mistake there. So same thing. I'm just holding down the space bar to move the image around when I need to. And I could spend more time on this, but you get the idea. I would go and get rid of all the little things that are on the floor until I clean up the floor and get it perfect. And even the folds in the paper can be uh, easily taken out. So those are kind of just getting rid of distracting elements. So I'm going to save this. Close it, pop back to Lightroom, where we will have oh, where we will have our before and after. And that before doesn't even include the bad crop. So again, if I kept working on that, getting rid of all the distracting objects, I could. All right. So let's keep going. Next up, um, sharpness. This is one of those things where people... Um, may not think about sharpness because it's one of those subtle things. You see it or you, you don't really notice it. Your photo just looks better. Uh, so there is a sharpening in both Photoshop and Lightroom for the overall photo. So if I were to go into the develop module here on this photo, if I were to go up to my presets, there's a built-in preset for Lightroom for sharpening faces. And the one for sharpening scenic, I like to use for everything other than faces. It's just my just my way of remembering which one's which. All right, so that will do an overall better job of sharpening the photo. And if you were in doubt of why I do it in Lightroom versus doing it in Photoshop, if we were to go to the detail panel and we were to hold down the option key and slide the mask, you'll see what it does automatically. It looks for everything that's in white is what it sharpened. So it didn't try and sharpen the skin. It automatically detected the face and adjusted a mask, built a mask for me of what got sharpened. And of course, I can adjust that mask and say, no, 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 sharpen less or no, 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 sharpen more. But notice if I do too much more, it's going to start picking up skin. So this is why I love doing my sharpening here inside of uh, Lightroom because of this beautiful built-in masking that does the right thing for people. However, she's got a tiara, she's got earrings, she's got all this other cool stuff going on, she's got eyes. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that I might want to sharpen more. So let's hit Command E, let's open up a copy of this inside of um, Photoshop. So I do my quick sharpen right, right there in Lightroom, but when I want to really get in and do some sharpening the way I really want to, I'll head over to Photoshop to do it. And here's why. Because Photoshop, and here I'll duplicate the layer this time so we can see it before and after. Photoshop has an actual sharpen tool. And the sharpen tool now has a great default called Protect Detail. So that means it won't screw up unless you really do it a lot. And so with the sharpen tool, and just go over the eye. Oh, I went too much. I did go too far there. Go over the eyes a little bit. And I go over things like the jewelry and the tiara and things that I really want. Now, the tiara and jewelry, I can go a little bit crazier and get that stuff in this necklace and get this neckline and get all of that stuff nice and sharp because it will just make the photo pop and stand out that much more. All right. So anyway. Let's see the before and after real quick. So it's going to be a subtle change. Hang on, let me zoom in. So before, look at her eyes. Look at the tiara. It's almost like, look, especially on the tiara, like in this area right here, it almost looked like a light got turned on. Watch. 
So things that should, especially in the eyes too, if you zoom in closer in the eyes, that's uh, before, that's after, just sharpening, bringing that out detail out a little bit more. But you can start to get pixelization if you go too much, especially on a low res photo. Uh, but adding just that little bit of extra sharpening will make your photo pop just a little bit more. That's why I love the sharpen tool. All right, so um, save that. Close it and get back to Lightroom and let's see. Okay, so we did white balance. We did crooked horizon. We did crop. We did sharpening. That's white balance, <laughs> crooked horizon, crop. Sharpness. We did a little bit of distracting objects, so that means a couple more. So, uh, the next one, exposure and perspective. Now, exposure typically means that your photo is either over or underexposed, and you can make it better um, by not over or <laughs> underexposing it. So, for example, if I were to go into this photo and just look at the exposure of it. Uh, let me make sure I reset this one. Yep, it's reset. Okay, if I look at the exposure of it, then I might just go in and say, you know what, what would this look like if it weren't so bright? If it were a little darker, it looks a little bit more dramatic. I like that. I could also say, you know what, Lightroom, I don't know what I'm doing. Auto tone it for me. Oh, thank you. That was much easier than me trying to figure out which sliders to pull. The auto tone works really good on, um, on landscape images. And of course, we can't have that crooked horizon that I'm I'm just seeing ever so slightly. So let's straighten that out just a bit. It was just a bit, actually. And away we go. Now, that still doesn't mean that you can't do more to it. So for example, you've got uh, the effects controls. You've got dehaze. I can just take some of the haze out of the sky there and make it even a little bit more dramatic. I've got the adjustment brush that I could go in and say, well... I like the amount of exposure that happened in the sky, but now I'm starting to lose a little bit of my foreground. So I would love to brighten up that foreground just a bit. Let me paint in a brighter foreground just so we can see it a little bit better. We can see the little pebbles in the water. So you really have a lot of fun. Or I want to maybe expose these um, icebergs a little bit better in the, um, in the horizon there. All right, so... Lots of cool things you can do with exposure, just making your photo more dramatic, properly exposed. Um, if it's overexposed, bring the exposure down. If it's underexposed, bring the exposure up. All right. And last but not least, we're going we're gonna to do two more things. We're going to do perspective. We're going to go back to distracting objects. Let's go back to, let's do perspective first. Perspective means that the photo is not just crooked. The perspective is off. And the perspective being off means it's just warped. It's at some weird angle. It's just the perspective is off. So the window looks just weird. It looks like it's at a weird angle. So again, one of the ways to fix that easily, quickly inside of Lightroom is under the transform controls. You've got upright. And the, the cool thing about upright is you can try auto. And you could try full, and you can get either all the way there or most of the way there. In this case, it's most of the way there. The window's still a little bit off. And unfortunately, there is no auto again. There's no full again. There's no way to say, do it again until you get it right. Uh, you could adjust the sliders manually at this point until you tweak it to be right. Or let's turn that off and go to the new newer guided command. With a guided command, I could say, you know what? This should be straight and nothing will happen because it takes at least two guides for this to work. And then I could say, this should be straight. And it's gonna get me, again, most of the way there, but not all the way there because I need more guides. In other words, there's just more things wrong with this window. So I could say, you know what? That should be straight. And that should be straight. So I can really change my perspective of an image and get that looking just right. And of course, you can still tweak. Um, you can still tweak the scale if I didn't like that little bit of, of whatever that was on the left hand side. I can still turn it and twist it a little bit more, but you get the idea. So that's um, that's using your guided upright command. 
All right, so that's fixing perspective. Last but not least, something else to look for inside your photos, again, are distracting objects. So let's, let's do a little bit more of that. Um, distracting objects, <laughs> here's, a, here's a perfect example of what's called a merger. A merger is when you when it looked like a good idea at the time to pose people in front of something, but then when you look at the actual picture or you look through the viewfinder, you see things sticking out of people, like the little stem sticking out of his head from the fruit or vegetable behind him, um, or even the little drops of water, things that could be distracting in the finished photo. Um, either A, don't shoot it that way. In other words, try and catch it before you shoot it. But if you shot it, it's too late, then you, you, you definitely want to clean the photo up and get rid of some of those distracting elements. So my friend Kathy uh, donated this picture for my tutorials. Um, I have got other merger pictures um, that are even funnier, but let's, uh, let's edit this one real quick. This is, this is going to be a job for Photoshop. And did I hit edit? Did I edit it? Let's see. Oh, wait. Do I, oh, I don't have this photo with me. This is only a smart preview. I don't have the original. So let's, uh, let's export it out, and then we'll edit it in Photoshop that way. Export. Let's export. Export it out. This is a case of having the original on a different drive. Uh, we're just going to export it out as as a DNG. All right, that'll be cool, export. So it won't be the full res, but it will give me a photo that I can actually open up in Photoshop. So let's open up this image. And now to correct the merger, same kind of thing we were doing with the other photo, we're gonna just get rid of some of these distracting elements. So I would start with my healing brush and just say, you know what? While that might have been cool on the original photo, they're really not doing any justice here. So let's just kind of get rid of these things that make me think, what are those things? All right, so now we've done that. We're going to zoom in to this area up here. And we're just going to say, you know, I really... Now this may or may not work because it's so close to his hair. So I'll let go, see what happens Yeah, I can live with that. If not, then I would have used the patch tool to try and patch that a little bit better. Same thing here. we got these little sparks, little highlights, whatever these are, sticking out of his head. And we're just going to get rid of some of those. Okay. Making your photo a little bit less distracting. So people are, in other words, when we say distracting, people aren't spending their time looking at what's behind the person versus the person. We want them to their eye to always be drawn to the subject. Same thing here where, okay, then you start saying, well, what's those two little spots in his reflections in his glasses? Can we do anything about that? So anything that's going to take you away from the main subject is technically a distracting object, and you should work towards alleviating them so that your eye is focused on the subject, not whatever the distraction is. So those are my seven things to look for inside of your photos when you're working with um, when you're working with portraits or images in general to, to look for. So number one, white balance. Get the proper white balance for the photo. Number two, fix those crooked horizon lines so that you don't have that. You have that instead. Number three, crop the image so you have just a better image in general and get rid of the distractions on the floor and things around it. Number four, um, not only sharpening your portraits and your images, but looking for individual things inside the photo that could be sharper. Number five, um, exposure. So taking, going from something that could be, um, hold on, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go back, hang on, I hit the wrong key there. I still keep hitting the wrong key, sorry about that. That is user error. All right, that's just not working. For, oh, yeah, I know why. Hold on. No, I don't know why. Okay, I'm hitting the wrong key for some reason. But anyway, getting getting back to a situation where, here, let me go to it, and I'll do it in history. Um, that versus that to correct your exposure. All right, so correct your exposure whenever possible. And um, two more things, perspective. 
Same thing here. Um, fixing your perspective so you don't have that where you have that instead. And last but not least, of course, getting rid of those distracting objects so that you don't have this. Instead, you have that. All right, so with that said, thanks everyone for watching and we will catch you on the next one. Uh, hang on, let's see. Uh, do you have a tutorial on the workspace in Lightroom? My layout looks totally different than yours. And I don't have items up top where it says library, etc. I don't have anything on the left of the photo. Well, that sounds like, Kathleen, that you're in Lightroom CC, not Lightroom Classic CC. So Lightroom CC doesn't have modules. It doesn't have that stuff on the left side. It's a totally different program. So Lightroom CC, easier, can do all the same things I just did, but it's a different program. So that might be why your interface looks different. That's what it sounds like you're describing. All right, so with that said, Thanks, everyone. Take care, and thanks for watching. We will catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody.